Chapter 24 The Scourge of Cain Malus Darkblade rode into the city of the Ageless Kings with a gleaming sword in his hand and a chaos storm raging at his back. Lightning roiled the crimson skies, etching the broken walls and crumbled towers in stark relief. Thunder rolled, matched by the terrible growl of the Nauglir as it stalked down the debris-choked lanes. Tribesmen rose from the furs they had slept on, clutching axes and swords, and peered into the night, sensing something terrible was at hand. Malus rode through the plaza of impaled men, passing the cross timbers where he himself had lain just hours before. The dark bulk of the temple reared before him, its skull-adorned flanks silhouetted in flickering displays of brazen lightning. He reined in his cold one at the base of the towering steps and regarded the sealed doors coldly. Spite reared his head at the ancient building and roared, a raw sound of fury that echoed roughly from the temple's thick walls. The double doors swung open within moments, and a troop of temple guards swarmed out, brandishing long, heavy polearms and axes. Malus slid from the saddle and took the warp sword in a two-handed grip, savoring the heat radiating out of the unearthly blade. It pulsed in time with his beating heart, quickening hungrily at the prospect of battle. The temple guards spread out at a run and charged down the steps, shouting the name of Cain, blessed lord of murder. A wolfish smile spread across Malus's grim face. Blood and souls, he whispered, and ran to meet them. He saw the battle unfold with dreadful icy clarity, as if it was a ritual dance unfolding in slow motion. A guard rushed in from the highborn's left, stabbing with his polearm. Malus hacked off his spearhead with a desultory sweep of the blade and cut the man in half with a backhanded stroke. Without pause, Malus swept his sword to the right to block the sweep of another guardsman's axe, before reversing the blade and cutting off both the warrior's legs above the knee. Armor parted like rotting paper, flesh blackened and bones splintered at the sword's ravening touch. Men's screams wove a brutal threatening around Malus as he wove among his foes, scattering arcs of hot blood that sizzled and steamed in the air. One guardsman swept low with his polearm, aiming to knock Malus off his feet. Before the blow could land, the highborn reached out and sank the point of the warp sword into the unrushing guard's neck and then spun on his heel and severed both arms and the helmeted head of the guard charging at Malus from behind. The highborn laughed like a drunkard, spinning and cutting with the seething blade and climbing ever higher towards the temple doors. A guard screamed in fury and leapt at him, heedless of the long fall to the plaza below. The move caught Malus off guard for a second, but with the battle fever upon him, his foe seemed to hang languorously into the air his muscular arms outstretched like a child's. Fluid like a blade dancer, Malus half-spun and dropped to one knee, bringing the sword up in a glittering stroke that sliced the man open from groin to chin and propelled his body in an arc to the grey stones at the Noglier's feet. There was a droning sound humming lazily towards Malus. He turned and swatted the thrown axe aside, and then dashed up the final few steps to the last remaining guard. The warrior had barely enough time to unsheathe his dagger before Malus was upon him. Both men regarded one another. This armored giant towered above the live highborn, his masked face looking down at the druki as if in startled amusement. And then the guard let out a bubbling sigh and bright blood erupted from the air holes in his visor as the highborn pulled the warp sword free from the man's breastplate. Malus stepped gracefully to the side as the giant's body crashed face down onto the stone steps and slid towards the bottom on a dark trail of gore. A pale figure regarded the highborn from just outside the temple doorway. The blood witch sank slowly to her knees, her marble-like eyes glittering fearfully as Malus approached her. Thin, wrinkled lips pulled back from yellow fangs in a frightful grimace of dread. I knew you would return, she groaned. I tried to tell the others, but they would not believe what I had seen. The ancient blood witch spread her hands. You are deaf and ruin given form, 
O oh, son of the house of chains, and the blessings of the dark gods go with you. Our time is finished. Let the time of blood begin. She raised her chin, and the warp sword seemed to leap in Malice's hands. The black blade flickered in the air, and the blood which stiffened in the wind of the sword's passing. Malice studied the witch coldly for a moment. A trickle of dark blood welled in a thin line across her narrow throat. The highborn stepped up to her and reached out, taking a handful of the white hair in his fist and lifting her severed head from her neck. The highborn hung the witch's head from his belt and stalked past her still upright body, heading into the darkness of the temple beyond. When Malice emerged from the temple a short while later, the tribe of the Red Sword was awaiting him. They filled the plaza at the foot of the temple, standing like wraiths amid the forest of impaled men. Lightning licked out steel helms and glittering mail, sharpened swords and bared fangs. Warped faces turned upwards as the highborn's armored figure strode to the top of the stairs, and every eye beheld the steaming sword and the trio of severed heads gripped in Malice's hands. Shebolai stood at the head of the tribe, waiting at the foot of the broad stairs with a look of grim joy on his face. Malus regarded him balefully, and then his gaze swept across the gathered warriors, with thunder rumbling from the north. The rule of the ageless kings is no more, Malus said, his sharp voice ringing out across the plaza. They forgot their duty to the lord of murder, and Cain has meted out his wrath. But their taint has spread to you, warriors of the Red Sword. The sons of Cain do not hide in cities of stone and turn their faces from the battlefield. The glory of the bloody-handed god lies in death, not in slaves, nor gold, nor stone walls. The ageless kings chose to cling to life, and you joined in their depravity. A groan rose from the assembled warriors at the highborn's harsh words. Malice cut him off with a shout. When Cain sent his chosen scourge to claim his birthright from the kings, they were sunk so far in their iniquity that they did not know him. Malice raised his terrible blade. Look upon the warp sword of Cain and know that his scourge has arisen. The warriors replied with shouts of anger and despair. Men slashed their cheeks and their chests, offering up their bloodstained blades to the highborn. Warriors turned on the weaker men of the tribe and hacked their bodies apart, throwing glistening bits of flesh and bone upon the steps of the temple. We live to serve, Shebolai cried out, his face a mask of shame and despair. Forgive us, dreadful scourge. There is no forgiveness in the eyes of Cain, Malice snarled. Only death, blood alone can wash away your sins. Then blood it will be, Shebolai roared. Show us the way, Holy One. We live and die at your command. The highborn looked down upon the chieftain and smiled an executioner's smile. Follow me, sons of the Red Sword. Death and glory await. Malice led the tribe out into the wasteland, returning to the place where the Vermilion Gate had left him. He had no idea if that would make any difference, but it did give him some time to think and take stock of the forces at his command. The Chaos Warriors did not march as an army of Nagaroth, in ordered lines and divisions. They swept over the plain in a ragged mob, maybe two hundred strong, riding quick, lean horses that moved as if they shared a single mind with their masters. Hoarse shouts and lusty war cries echoed in the darkness, as the warriors followed the scourge from the city. The prospect of battle had quickened their blood, banishing any doubt or fear. The same could not be said about Malice, though. He rode ahead of the unruly mob with the warp sword riding in the scabbard against his hip. With the weapon sheathed, he felt cold again, the heat of Cain's hunger leeching away from his muscles and leaving him wretched and weak. Every few moments, his hand would stray to the weapon hilt, as if he was warming himself by the side of a small fire. Tsarkan stirred in malice. Where before the demon's presence seemed to swell within the highborn's chest, now it caused his whole body to tremble. 
You grow overbold, little Druki. The demon sneered. You trifle with forces beyond your understanding. And you think to lead this pitiful mob to war with your brother? Malus looked back at Shebolai, riding out just a few yards behind the highborn, and beyond to the shifting crowd of riders spread across the plain. I don't expect them to triumph, he said coldly. I expect them to die, in as dramatic a fashion as possible. I will need a grand diversion if I am to reach the sanctum of the sword and deal with your rile. It was a gamble, to be sure, and a desperate one. As fearsome as the warp sword was, Malus didn't care to pit himself against Tyron and his entire band of zealots. If he could distract them from inside the walls of the fortress, it might buy him enough time to reach the temple and confront Uriel directly. He hoped that with his half-brother dead, the zealots would accept him as the new scourge, or else lose heart and scatter into the night. Then he could deal with Rulan or whoever was commanding the forces of the temple. You think you can defeat your rile by yourself? The demon sneered. Malice's hand strayed towards the hilt of the warp sword. With this I can. You are a fool, Dark Blade. No, demon, you put this sword in my hands. If you didn't think I would take it up and use it to slay my enemies, then you are the fool, not I. As he spoke, Malus caught sight of a trio of ragged figures lying upon the lifeless ground and realized they reached the site of the battle with Shebolai's companions. He prodded Spite into a canter and rode halfway up to the shallow rise so he could turn and regard the tribesmen. As the Noglir heeled about, the riders brought their mounts to a halt and waited expectantly. Malus drew the warp sword, shuddering slightly at the rush of heat flooding in his body. Warriors of the Red Sword, he cried, the hour of your redemption is at hand. Follow me and cleanse your souls in the blood of the foe. Kill every man that stands in your way. Shebolai drew a fearsome curved sword and waved it in the air. Blood for the blood god. The night air erupted in a cacophony of bestial shouts to Cain. Mala smiled and focused his will upon the sword. Open the gate, he commanded. Return us to the temple, you damned lord of murder, and we will reap a red harvest in your name. An angry rumble shook the air. Whether it was thunder or the growl of a bloodthirsty god, Malice couldn't say. For at that moment, the warriors of the tribe cried out in terror, and the world turned inside out. They appeared under clear skies, with a bright pair of moons overhead. The transition was so jarring that for a moment Malus was entirely disorientated. Horses screamed and men shouted in wonder and fear. The night shook with the stern cry of trumpets, and Malus heard shouts of alarm echoing down the lanes of the temple fortress. And then the world snapped back into focus. Malus and the warriors found themselves in the broad avenue between the Citadel of Bone and the dwarf-built temple. White-robed zealots were charging from every building and pathway, and the alarm trumpets continued to sound. It was as if their arrival had been expected somehow, the highborn thought. If so, his gambit had already failed. The sound of battle revivified the Chaos Warriors, however, and already screams and clashes of steel echoed across the avenue. Malus stood in his saddle. Warriors of Cain, redeem yourselves in the blood of your foes. With a bloodthirsty roar, the marauders spurred their horses and threw themselves headlong at the zealots, and in moments a fierce swirling melee raged along the length of the avenue. More zealots were streaming in from every direction, but for a moment the horsemen had an edge in both numbers and mobility. The highborn knew that the tide would turn soon enough. Malus put his heels to Spite's flanks and dashed for the temple. White-robed warriors raced along his path from left and right, trying to cut him off. The highborn pulled on the reins and headed directly at the zealot to the right. To his credit, the zealot held his ground, readying his weapon to strike at Spite's head, 
but at the last moment Malice changed direction again, veering left and swiping his sword at the warrior as he went past. The zealot's drike bit into Spite's shoulder just as Malice took off the top of the warrior's skull. Steel rang on Malice's left side. He glanced over the shoulder in time to see the second zealot's headless body collapsing to the ground. Shebolai and half a dozen marauders had fallen in behind Malice, using spears and swords to kill anyone who came too close. The marauder chieftain raised his sword to the heavens, laughing like a fiend. Malice grinned cruelly and put his boots to Spite's flanks. The doors to the temple were open as Malice reined in before the building brought steps. Fearing an ambush, he dismounted quickly and let Shebolai and the marauders take the lead. The Chaos Warriors raced across the threshold, and almost immediately Malice heard screams and the sounds of battle. As he charged through the doorway, he found the marauders slaughtering a group of temple servants, who had been stacking a new set of trophies close to the doors. This way, Malice shouted, as he dashed across the large chamber. Shebolai and the men followed the highborn as he raced up the stairs to the chapel. He burst into the chamber expecting at least a few zealot guards. But the smaller chamber was empty. Something is wrong, Malice thought, feeling the first twinges of dread tickle at his heart. The cauldron of Cain seethed and bubbled on the ceremonial dais with no one to attend it. It felt like an ambush, but how could Uriel have possibly expected this? Gritting his teeth, Malice decided it didn't matter. He was committed, one way or another, and would have to see things through to the bitter end. Taking a deep breath, he made his way to the sanctum stairs. Shebolai and the marauders gasped at the towering statue of Cain as they worked their way around the dais and climbed to the red-lit doorway. Malice gripped the warp sword tightly, drawing strength from its heat as he approached the door. He remembered all too well what had happened the last time he stood on that narrow threshold. Raw power was seething from the doorway, washing over Malice's skin and making the warp sword vibrate in his hands. Be ready for anything, the highborn warned the marauders, and stepped inside. Malice, though, was not prepared for what he found. The very air howled and shimmered with pain. Malice stood at the foot of a broad bridge fashioned from skulls that crossed a sea of seething red. Heat and light rose from the surface like the glow of a furnace, searing his skin and filling his ears with the cries of the damned. At the far end of the bridge stood another doorway leading into the sanctum, and at the bridge's midpoint, naked and gleaming in the ruddy light, stood Yasmir. Malus looked upon her and felt smaller and weaker than he'd ever known before. She was unearthly, radiant in her lethal beauty. Her dark eyes met his and she smiled, revealing her leonine fangs. Behind Malice, one of the marauders moaned like a frightened child. Who is she? asked Shebolai, voice full of dread. Malice didn't know what to say. Finally he shrugged. She is my bride, he said grimly, and went to meet her. She waited for his approach, spreading her arms slightly. Had it not been for the slim, needle-like knives in her hands, she might have been offering herself to her lover. The highborn clenched the warp sword tightly. One did not fight Yasmir. One offered oneself up to die. For an instant he thought about a demon, but he pushed that idea away. The warp sword would have to be enough. Her gaze was inscrutable. It was as if she stared through him, seeing some vista beyond the ken of mortals. When she was within reach of his longer sword, he came to a halt. His fingers flexed on the sword's leather-wrapped hilt. Yasmir made no move. She continued staring through him as if he wasn't even there. Malice frowned. Hello, sister. At the sound of his voice, her expression changed. Her eyes shifted slightly, as if she was seeing him for the first time, and then she was flying at him, her daggers reaching for his throat. Malice brought the warp sword up in the nick of time, barely deflecting the lethal strikes. But there was no time to recover, as the living saint switched targets and began a series of deadly thrusts at his face, chest and groin. She never stopped moving, 
flowing towards him like a dancer and making a lethal move with each and every step. He didn't have time to be afraid. The warp sword seemed to move on its own, matching Yasmir blow for blow. Once again, he saw the fight unfold with a detached clarity, as if he was a spectator rather than a combatant. Her speed and grace were devastating. Even though he could read Yasmir's next attack, his body was hard-pressed to counter it. She drove him back steadily, keeping him constantly on the defensive. A dagger thrust sank a quarter of an inch into his throat, but he barely felt it. Another blow stung him like an adder just below the eye. The next one was going to hit his hip, right where the breastplate met his fold. Malice waited until the last possible moment, and then pivoted on his left foot and let her thrust slide past. He continued the spin, turning it into a lightning-quick backhanded cut aimed at her neck. The warp sword hissed in the air, but Yasmir was already gone, rolling forwards out of the sword's path. Malice rushed at her, but Yasmir recovered from the roll at once and whirled, knocking aside his top thrust and making a blurring stab at his neck. The highborn sensed the strike and faded back, deflecting the thrust with the flat of his blade. Two marauders charged at Yasmir, their weapons aiming for her slender back. She reversed her daggers with a flourish and stabbed both warriors in the heart, before pushing their corpses off and tucking into a tight roll towards the highborn. When she came out of the roll, her blades were reaching for his throat, and a terrible smile of joy lit her unearthly face. Malus had anticipated the attack and ducked beneath the thrust. His sword swept up at her torso, and her knives fell into a cross block, trapping his sword. Malus yanked the sword clear, feigned low and then thrust at her neck, just as she twisted her body, deflecting the attack with her right hand dagger and stabbing at Malus with her left. The point of the dagger scratched the hollow of his throat and stopped. She could reach no further with her right hand blocking Malus's sword. They were at a deadlock. Yasmir looked into Malus's eyes. She seemed to truly recognize him for the first time. I cannot kill him, she said brevely. Malus gave her a bemused frown, and then realized she wasn't speaking to him. From behind the highborn, back towards the doorway at the far end of the bridge, he heard Uriel's angry voice. What is this foolishness? Malus fought quickly. She cannot kill me because we are too evenly matched, he said. Slowly, carefully, he stepped away from Yasmir and lowered his sword. She mirrored his moves exactly. As befits a bride and a groom, don't you think? Angry shouts from the other end of the bridge caught his attention. The marauders were retreating from a group of blood-handed zealots, and two fearsome grey figures that crawled like spiders down the stone walls above the doorway to the chapel. The chaos beasts lashed their tentacles hungrily as they sank closer to their prey. There was a meaty thump near Malus's feet, and something bounced heavily off his cowl. He looked down and saw Arle Van's blood-stained head roll to a stop at his feet. He told me everything, Uriel hissed. An assassin's body can resist torture, but his spirits are powerless to one such as I. Malice turned to face his half-brother, pure murder dancing in his eyes. If he told you where I went, he said, raising the warp sword, then you know what this is. Uriel stood at the far end of the bridge, the copy of the warp sword clutched in his left hand. His face twisted with rage. It is not yours, you misbegotten cur. It is meant for me. I was reborn in the cauldron while you were whelped by that naggerite whore. If you are here, it is because Cain willed it so. You are here so that I may take the sword from your broken and bleeding body. Malice smiled. Do you want it, brother? Come then, and take it. Uriel screamed like one of the damned and charged at Malus, sword held ready. Behind the highborn, Shebolai roared a challenge at the zealots, and suddenly the air rang with the clash of steel and the screams of the dying. Malus charged at his half-brother, a war scream bursting out of his throat. 
he read Uriel's every move, knowing his blade would come slashing down for his shoulder half a second before the blow even fell. The warp sword swept up, knocking the blow aside. Then Malus reversed the stroke and sliced at Uriel's chest. Before the blow could connect, however, Uriel's form blurred, and the sword passed through the space where he had been. Damn sorcery! Malus whirled just as Uriel's blade whipped at his face from an unexpected angle. Caught by surprise, the sword sliced neatly across his cheek. Hot blood poured down his face, and Uriel laughed. Malus stabbed at his half-brother, but again the sorcerer's form blurred and seemed to coalesce three feet to his left. Uriel's sword stabbed out, glancing from Malus's armor, and the highborn spun and slashed down at the extended arm, but once again it was like cutting air. Uriel blurred and then reformed again to Malus's right. This time the highborn was expecting an attack and was ready when Uriel lashed out at his neck. Malus parried the blow and stepped in for a thrust. But again, his half-brother turned to smoke and reappeared three feet to the highborn's right. The sword of his half-brother flashed, and Malus felt a spike of pain lance through his right thigh. The highborn roared in anger and rushed at his half-brother just as a heavy weight landed on the bridge behind him. He heard the tentacles hissing through the air a fraction too late, as the chaos beast entwined his sword arm and waist and lifted him into the air. Hissing, gobbling howls rang in Malus's ears as the beast reared onto its hind legs and lashed at Malus with the rest of the tentacles. Barbed hooks grated across Malus's armor as he was spun through the air. He could hear Uriel cursing the beast, but the hunter paid the sorcerer no mind, intent on drawing Malus towards its clashing beak. Snarling, Malus shifted the warp sword to his free hand and slashed at the tentacles holding him. The warp sword parted the flesh whips in a spray of steaming ichor, and he plunged face first to the ground. He hit hard on the left shoulder and rolled away down the beast's right flank. Malus rolled to his feet as the chaos creature rounded on him, and he buried the sword in the creature's neck just as two of the tentacles smashed against the side of his head. The blows knocked the highborn to the ground and he rolled clear, dragging the sword with him. When his vision cleared, Malus found himself facing back towards the chapel end of the bridge. The second chaos beast had leapt from the wall and clung to the side of the stone span, snatching men in the midst of the melee and lifting them clear. As Malus watched, the hunter snatched one of the marauders from the battle and lifted the wriggling body high overhead, whereupon it began to pull the man limb from limb. Tyron and Shebolai faced each other, trading blows with their curved swords in a blur of razor-edge motion. All around them, zealots and marauders tore at each other with single-minded ferocity. Although it was clear that with the chaos beast on their side, the zealots would soon gain the upper hand. Yasmir stood apart from the battle, watching the slaughter with dispassionate interest. A shadow loomed over malice. Uriel's sword whirred in the air and struck the bridge where the highborn had been but Malus had rolled away and was clambering unsteadily to his feet. Roaring with hatred, Uriel charged at his half-brother, launching a series of powerful blows that Malus blocked with steady, death strokes. Malus didn't attempt to strike back, knowing that it would only give Uriel a chance to discorporate and strike at him from an unexpected angle. Instead, he gave ground, defending himself easily and trying to think of a way to turn the tables. With every step, Malus drew closer to the melee at the end of the bridge. On impulse, he blocked Uriel's next attack, and turned and ran towards the battle. Behind him, Uriel laughed in disdain and lurched after him, dragging his twisted foot across the smooth stone. A zealot struck down one of the chaos warriors and stepped in Malus's path. The highborn cut the man in half and dashed past him before the bloody halves even hit the ground. He raced to right for the last chaos beast, which saw him coming and reached for him with eight thrashing tentacles. He seemed to race directly into the creature's embrace, but at the last moment he threw himself to the ground and rolled beneath the creature's head. Just as he'd hoped, Uriel ran headlong into the monster's clutches. The chaos beast, unable to tell the difference between friend and foe, reached for Uriel just as eagerly. But again, the sorcerer's form blurred and he appeared three feet to the left of where he'd stood. 
Half mad with fury, Uriel stabbed the beast in the eye, and it plunged from the edge of the bridge with a shriek. One of the last marauders leapt at Uriel from behind, but the usurper twisted at the waist and sliced the man in half with a savage swipe of the blade. There was a scream to Malice's left as the last zealot leapt at the two remaining marauders. Both chaos warriors buried their blades in the druki's chest, but the zealot crashed heavily into the two men, bearing all three of them over the edge of the bridge and into the Red Sea beneath. Their screams ended as they sank beneath the heaving liquid and did not rise again. Only Tyron and Shebolai were left. Both men circled each other warily, bleeding from scores of deep wounds on their chests and arms. Shebolai raised his sword and charged Tyron with a fierce roar as Malice looked on. The zealot leader watched the man come and ducked the chieftain's swing at the last second, thrusting with his drake and taking Shebolai squarely in the chest. The onrushing warrior impaled himself on Tyron's blade, the drake bursting from Shebolai's back. Before Tyron could pull the blade free though, the chieftain grabbed the zealot leader's wrist. Smiling madly, the chieftain pulled Tyron towards him, driving the man's sword deeper into his chest. Tyron tried to pull away, but the warrior's grip was like iron. Shebolai's sword flashed, and Tyron's sword arm was hacked away at the shoulder. The zealot staggered back with a hideous scream and fell off the bridge. Still smiling, Shebolai sank to the ground and toppled over, dead. Uriel charged Malus with a roar, thrusting at a highborn's neck. Malus blocked the thrust and swung at Uriel's head, but again the sorcerer's body blurred and reappeared three feet away. The usurper's sudden counterattack nearly took Malus's head off, but he saw the blow just in time and ducked out of the way. Malice's half-brother laughed. You are done for, Darkblade, he taunted. I can do this all night if I must. I know, Malice snapped, swinging at Uriel's chest. The sorcerer's form blurred, but the highborn continued swinging, aiming for a point three feet to the left. Uriel screamed, staring down at a black sword jutting from between his ribs. Blood poured down the length of the warp sword, turning to steam against its hot edge. It makes you predictable, Mala said, and pulled the sword free. Uriel staggered backwards, the sword falling out of his hands. Blood poured in a rush down the front of his armor. He fell back and found himself enfolded in the slender arms of Yasmir. She laid him gently to the ground, cradling his head in her hands. Uriel stared up at her, a look of longing in his eyes. His mouth was working breathlessly. Yasmir rose and walked around him, kneeling at his side. Smiling lovingly, she placed her hands at the joint of his breastplate and pulled. Rivets popped and straps broke as she tore the armor away, revealing Uriel's misshapen chest. And then the living saint ran a delicate finger down the usurper's uneven sternum until she found the spot she wanted and dug in with both hands. Cartilage popped wetly as Yasmir ripped open her brother's chest. The last thing Uriel saw was his beloved sister feeding on his still-beating heart. As it happened, the warriors of the Red Sword acquitted themselves far better than Malus had ever imagined. After slaying all the zealots and the temple servants they could find, they opened the gates of the fortress and rampaged into the ravaged city. Several of their bodies were found as far away as the warehouse district, when the warriors of the temple made their way back into Harganef. Malus sat back in the throne of the Grand Carnifex as the arch hierophant Rulan entered the council arena, attended by a handful of priests and priestesses. When the elder saw Malus, his relieved expression turned into a look of abject horror. You! he exclaimed. What happened? Where's your royal? The highborn eyed the elder contemptuously. Why, Arch Hierophant, don't you remember the plan? I said I would find a way to strike at the usurper directly, and so I did. He will trouble the temple no more. He leaned back in the throne, right hand resting on the pommel of the unsheathed warp sword. I would have resolved this more quickly, but the diversion I'd been led to expect never materialized. 
Roland gaped at Malice, his eyes widening in fear. It, that is, we tried, but the citizens had gone mad. We could not reach the temple. Where is the other elder? Malice interjected. The striking one with the tattoos. Uh, Maria? Roland stammered. She, she died trying to reach one of the more isolated warbands. Meaning she tried to fulfill your part of the plan and died fighting, while you cowered in a basement somewhere. Malice snarled. Do not presume to judge me, Roland cried. I did what I thought best. He looked back at his attendants and then fixed Malice with a conspiratorial stare. You, you couldn't have beaten Uriel. He had a warp sword. He couldn't be defeated in battle. Malice smiled coldly. Ah, yes, the scriptures. So let me understand this correctly. In the interest of doctrinal veracity, you betrayed me and left me to die. Is that right? Rulan began to tremble. No, no, it wasn't like that. We had to wait for Malekith to arrive. He could have found a way to stop the usurper. Fortunately for our people, he won't have to. Malus rose from the throne, holding the fake warp sword in his left hand. Stepping to the edge of the railing, he jumped off and landed on the arena floor. A flare of pain in his wounded leg made him wince, but he pushed the feeling aside. Actually, the discomfort was a good sign. It meant that the demon's power wasn't healing him as well as it had been. The power of the sword was somehow counterbalancing it. He didn't know how, but he was not going to question it for the time being. Malice straightened and walked over to Rulan. This, I believe, belongs to the temple, he said, dropping the fake blade with a clang at the arch hierophant's feet. The Grand Carnifex can return it to the Sanctum, and as far as Nagaroth is concerned, it never left its home. Rulan frowned. I... I don't understand. I know, Mala said, and then beheaded Rulan with the warp sword. Men and women screamed in horror as the Arch Hierophant's body collapsed to the floor. Mala silenced them with a cold stare. Then he leveled his sword at one of the priestesses. You, come here. Nirial stepped out of the crowd. She had put aside her axe at some point and changed into better clothes. Unlike Rulan, she mastered her fear, keeping her chin up as she stepped closer to the bloodstained sword. Malice gave the priestess a murderous look. You weren't taken by assassins. You slew the other sentry and then betrayed us to your rile. The priestess never flinched. I was certain you were deceiving us, and as it happened, you were. Then, as soon as your rile was dead, you switched sides again. I serve the temple, Nirial said. Mala smiled. I thought you would say as much. That's why I'm making you the new Grand Carnifex. Out of all the people in this damn fortress, you're the only one whose motives I can actually understand. The other attendants gasped. Even Nirial was stunned. You... you can't do that, she said. Malus raised the warp sword. I am the Chosen of Cain, Nerial. I most certainly can. He surveyed the other loyalists. And they shall be your new Haruan. They seem a dim sword, but since they know the truth about the sword, we can either kill them or make use of them. Nerial struggled with her sudden change in fortune for a moment more, and then managed to recover her composure. What would you have us do, Holy One? she asked. The Highborn smiled. That's better. You will return the counterfeit sword to the Sanctum. At this point, no one who saw your rile with the blade is still alive, except for us. What about the Witch King? He is probably marching up the Slaver's Road even now. When he arrives, you'll receive him with luxurious hospitality, and inform him of your usurpation, Mala said. Tell him that 
Uriel and the cabal of zealots use chaos magic to sow discord among the citizens and then kill the temple elders. There was fighting in the streets for a week, but in the end you sent a group of volunteers through the tunnels and they managed to assassinate the usurper and the ringleaders. The witch king will probably want to execute someone to vent his anger, but other than that he should be satisfied with the outcome. He raised the sword in warning. You will not tell him anything about me or Yasmir. She is to remain in the sanctum until such a time as the witch king departs. After that, she may do as she wills. Nerial thought everything over and finally nodded in satisfaction. It shall be as you say, Holy One, but what about you? I am leaving, Mala said. Summer is almost done, and I have pressing business elsewhere. Malus reluctantly slid the warp sword into its scabbard. Spite was waiting at the fortress's beast pen, packed and ready to ride. Somewhere out there was the amulet of Vaurog, the final relic the demon required. Time was growing short. He pushed his way through the crowd of stunned attendants, walking briskly to the door, and then Nirial called out. I don't understand. You are the scourge. The warp sword of Cain is yours. What about the time of blood? Are you not here to lead us into an age of death and fire? Malus paused. He looked back through the crowd at Nirial, his hand straying to the hilt of the burning blade. Perhaps, he said with a ghostly smile. But not today. The apocalypse will have to wait. The End You've listened to Darkblade, Volume 4, Warp Sword, written by Dan Abnett and Mike Lee.